Today we're going to continue in our series of the seven last words of Christ on the cross. Now I would just also like to say I'm just so thankful to the children's ministry and just what they do every Sunday for, for our children. You know, it's just such a blessing just to have dedicated group of, of, of believers who really are passionate about teaching our children. It's so important. So I just, I just thank them for that publicly. Thank our ushers today and little Zentavius over there. He's just getting better and better as he stands up and, you know, does his thing. We're just, just thankful for all the ministries here at Antioch. So we're going to continue in our series today in uh, the second saying of Jesus on the cross. We're going to turn, be back in the book of Luke, same chapter that we were in last time, which is Luke chapter 23, verses 40 through 43. That's Luke chapter 23, verses 40 to 43. I don't know what page that's in, in the Bible under your seat. 730? 737. Page 737 in the Bible under your seat. That's Luke 23, verses 40 through 43. When you found it, please stand for the reading of God's word. And it says this. It says, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the second word. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you because we know that those who, are, who have accepted you as Lord and Savior are truly with you in paradise, not just now, but forever. Lord, we thank you today for this word and I pray, God, that as we talk about beyond shame, that you will help us, God, just to live a little bit higher and closer to you. We thank you, God, for your words on the cross that love us and that are accepting of people who didn't deserve to live. I pray, God, that you would help us as we hear your word, but not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray and let everyone say Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The name of our sermon today is Beyond Shame. Beyond Shame. So, in order to experience the true blessing of salvation, of being saved, and the transformation of sanctification, which is, which is being set apart for God and, and set apart to do his will and his work, we have to get beyond our shame. But first we need to talk a little bit about guilt and shame, which are basically very similar in how I'm using them. So this is the introduction part. And in the introduction, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fact that sin causes guilt and shame. Sin causes guilt and shame. After all, it caused guilt and shame with, with the very first people that God created, Adam and Eve. Sin caused them guilt and shame in the garden. Remember what they did, right? After they sinned before God, they did what? They put fig leaves on, they hid. All of those things were because of guilt and shame surrounding their sin. So guilt is a cognitive or emotional experience that occurs when a person believes or realizes, accurately or not, that he or she has compromised his or her own standards of conduct or has violated a moral standard and bears significant responsibility for that violation. 
Similarly, shame is a feeling of guilt or regret or sadness that you have because you know you've done something wrong. It's a painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt or shortcoming or impropriety. Guilt and shame always cause us to think that we never quite measure up. Guilt and shame can be brought on by our life experiences. For example, the youngest of children realize when their lives don't measure up. Like when kids talk about their dad and you don't know who yours is. Or you begin to wonder what happened to your mom because you're being raised by your aunt and not even your grandma. So I want to take, for example, Kirk Franklin. Everybody knows that name, Kirk Franklin, in the gospel arena. He was abandoned by his mother at, at birth and raised by his aunt. He was gifted in music at a very, very young age and became a minister of music at his church at the age of like seven. Despite his auntie keeping him in church, he was in trouble though at an early age. He rebelled because of being unwanted. And so he systematically tried to dismantle his life because he was so angry. He longed for the love of parents. So he got into a lot of trouble. He was in a lot of trouble. And he was surrounded by a lot of family who were on drugs or, or in jail and all of those things that go along with severe, severe dysfunction. His troubled childhood spilled over into adulthood and spilled over into his marriage. But finally, God did a work in his life because like we're going to see in a second, like the criminal or the thief on the cross, he hit rock bottom after a very public admission to a pornography addiction that almost cost him his marriage. He's been married now for like 19 years. Um, and today he say, says that every day he has to divorce himself from the world and draw near to God. Because you see, the true blessing of salvation believes that our sins are truly forgiven, that we are cleansed, and that we have power over our sin, and ultimately that Christ will sanctify us to live our best life. Shame. Shame seeps into our DNA, and it builds filth in our lives so that it continues to circulate throughout our minds all the time. And without Christ, we manifest shame through different kinds of behaviors, different kinds of behaviors. So sometimes we have shame because of the things we've done, or sometimes we have shame because of what's been done to us, or most of the time, it's a combination of both. You see, shame creates strongholds, and simply a stronghold is something that dominates our thinking and our behavior. Some emotional strongholds are tied to something that's physiologic, which means there's something that's wrong with the body itself, a chemical imbalance or some sort of physical need. However, a large number of emotional strongholds are not physiological in nature. They're rooted in sin. They're either rooted in your own sin or rooted in someone else's sin that has affected you. Maybe you were abused as a child or raped or betrayed in a relationship or feel unwanted or was, were unwanted. It wasn't your sin that created the stronghold you may now be facing, but now you have fear and insecurity or guilt or shame, but it was still sin that caused it. So I've often heard people say, I was raised in church just like Kirk Franklin, but there's a difference between salvation and sanctification. So what is salvation? That's accepting the fact that Jesus died for your sin and that you're forgiven and cleansed from sin, that your slate is now wiped clean and the sin of, the sin, the sh sin of shame is gone. But now then the real work begins of letting God Heal your behavior and thinking because of the shame you've experienced. This is the process of sanctification. It's the divorcing of the self from the world's perspective to God's perspective. And the divorce is painful 
Because how many of you have been divorced? I know divorce is painful. But the process of sanctification is daily because Satan never stops trying to lure us into sin and inject us with more and more filth that paralyzes and numbs us to the truth. He never, ever stops. On Wednesday, I was walking <clears throat> from work and going to uh, King Supers on 13th and Spear, which was a pretty good walk. By the time you walk there and walk back, it's about a mile. It was a nice day. And I saw as I was going down the steps into King Supers, um, into the parking lot there, I saw an addict that had just shot up. And I'm sure it was probably heroin. And as I wrote this sermon, it just reminded me of the world's numbing effects on our minds and how useless we become. He was totally just out of it, doing that, that heroin sleep um, that you get when you just are so numb to everything around you. And there are so many people who may not be on a physical drug, but are just checked out just checked out. And I want to point your attention to God's word about being checked out. So we're going to look at Romans 1. And I want you to just follow along with me as I read 21 through like 32. Because I think it's an important, it's an important passage of scripture that we don't read very often and that people want to deny is there. But it says a whole lot of truth. So if you can turn to the book of Romans, it's in the New Testament, <clears throat> right after the book of Acts. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. And we're talking about people who are just checked out. It says, for although they knew God, and he's talking about us, people, God's creation, so we could say, for although God's creation knew him, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile or useless, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed eyes, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. How do you worship something that God created? That's what this is saying. How do you worship the creation and not the creator? Then in 24 it says, therefore God gave them over. God let them be in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned the natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved or corrupted mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips and slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, or no commitment, no loyalty, no love, no mercy. Although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Hmm. What does God say? What's wrong with all of this stuff? It corrupts God's intention for his creation. 
You see, sin causes guilt and shameful behavior because it corrupts God's intention for his creation. So in order to experience the true blessing of salvation and the transformation of sanctification, you've got to get beyond your shame. You see, the thief on the cross, you want to call him a rebel, a rebel or a criminal or an insurrectionist, someone who really uh, was, was against the government. That thief, that one thief got beyond his shame and Jesus came into his life that day. But how did he do it? But how do, did he do it? So my first point today is that you got to get real about who you are. Amen? You got to get real about who you are. You got to get real about who you are. We live in a society that's masked. People are not real about who they are. But you got to be real about who you are. So let's get back to the criminals on the cross. Because guess who they represent? They represent us, don't they? <coughs> They represent those in Christ, one of them does, and those without Christ. Okay. One thief would die in his sin because he was unrepentant. If you go back to verse 39 of that same chapter, it says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. Listen carefully, because in fact, for this thief, Jesus became the enemy that would not side with him in his sin. Isn't that why the world rejects God? Because he won't let them off the hook for their sin? Just take me down. Just let me be who I am. You said you can save me. Well, save me in my sin. But that's not how this works. Isn't that what, though, we're saying to Christ when we willfully sin and we're unrepentant? Why can't you get with what I'm doing, God? Why can't everything I do be okay with you? It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't, like the, like the woman on the insurance, come on, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We accuse God of kind of being a killjoy, you know. Just get me out of trouble, God, when I get in it. Hmm. But in Philippians 3, verses 18 and 19, it says this. Now, now, Paul is talking to believers here. It says, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, that many of us live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He says their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So to get beyond your shame, you have to be ashamed of what you are when you stand before a holy God. And the most vivid portrayal of that that I can think of is Isaiah in chapter 6, when he enters into the throne room of God. And he says, you know what? I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm standing before this God who is perfectly holy. And the angels come, and they, they take tongues, and they put it to his lips to burn away all the impurity that's inside of him so that he could be clean before God. Hmm. You have to realize that you've sinned because of the lies you told, because of the things you stole, because of the secret sins you hid, the filth that passes your lips in speech and eats that ruin your health, the lustful thoughts you had, the things you touched, the things you let touch you, nasty jokes and long tokes, the debt you're in, the anger you sleep with, just plain old disobedience. I read this story as I was preparing about a young man who says when he was a teenager, he's writing as an adult, he said, I stole a hat. He said, what's worse, I arrived at the store with a wad of cash in my pocket. He said, I was staring at the price tag and I thought, hey, why should I spend my money on that hat? I can get it for nothing by pinching it, then save my money for something else. As I headed for the door, the store manager stopped me. And he says, I suddenly wished I was dead. 
The manager saw I was not yet a hardened criminal and sent me home with instructions to have my parents call him back with the news or he would call the police. So I went home to take my lumps. To this day, I remember what my 18-year-old sister said when she overheard me confessing. How totally embarrassing. I got a brother who's a thief. She called me a thief. But by becoming ashamed of what we are as a result of what we do is a good thing. And it's a necessary part of getting real about guilt. If you commit adultery, guess what? You're an adulterer. If you lie, guess what? You're a liar. I don't care how small and white the lie is. If you steal, you're what? You're a thief. It led me to, he says, it led me to my room, weeping and ashamed of myself, but that was good. It was painful, but it was good. You see, the thief on the cross got saved that day because he realized an innocent man of God was going to his death because of what the thief had done. He made the connection that Jesus could only be a king, a good king who forgive people. When someone was nailed to the cross, when you went to the cross for, your, for your, your crimes, they put your crimes on the cross. People knew what you did. You know what was on Jesus' uh, cross? The king of the Jews. That was it. For the other two, their, their, their crimes were nailed to the cross. And so he made that connection to say, he's a king. He's a king. And he just said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Hmm. A cross was reserved for the worst of the worst, and he realized that he was the worst of the worst. Who was this king who would go to death for me and for them? You see, he got real about the fact that he was guilty for, before God. And he was so sorry right there and right then he had to get beyond the shame of what he had done. And when he got be, beyond the shame, then and only then could he turn toward Christ. So have you gotten real today? Some of us are saved and believers, but we have some real stuff that happened a long time ago. We're Christians, but we still have stuff that we won't get real about. So we're stuck. Amen. Point number two. Once you get beyond your shame and you admit who you are, then you have to turn your head toward the cross. So my second point is turn your head toward the cross. You see, as we said, the thief had to get beyond the shame of what he had done and then turn his head toward the only one who could save him from punishment for his sin. Some people get real about who they are, but they never really can overcome or, or, or be overcomers or overcome their sin because they turn their head to things that have no power. That's what we read in Romans 1. They turn their head to animals and all kind of junk you think can save you and self-help books and all of that kind of thing. But that stuff can't save you. I have people on my job who think that crystals can save you. You know them crystals you find in the ground? They think crystals have power. They sleep with them in the bedroom on the shelf. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Some people think, I, I know a woman who has a bunch of beads it's a, it's, a, it's a thick row of beads. And she says that that comforts her spirit when she holds on to beads. I was like, okay. Seriously. Some people think that all kinds of stuff that you find in the earth, even, I'm not saying that oils and things can't help with stuff, but can they really cure sin? Do you think? Can they really cure the emotional stuff, the baggage, the shame that we carry all the time? No. Mm -mm. Some people think that relationships have the power to save them. If I get with him or I get with her, then that's going to help me be a better person. Okay. If I drink a certain thing or drink a certain potion or eat a certain thing, 
Some people think that meditation or some kind of mantra has that kind of power. Huh. I'm just saying, y'all, these are the kinds of things that we hear. People think that these things will make up for all my shame, but don't buy into those lies. Remember what we talked about last week, that nothing can wash away the filth of sin that circulates through us except the blood of Jesus Christ. Just like we talked about last time, it's only the blood that cleanses us from sin. Nothing else can do the job. It's Jesus Christ that makes the difference. You see, that day, that one thief crossed from death to life and some of us sitting here today are just waiting to die like the other thief on the cross but Jesus is inviting you to be with him today in paradise just like the thief came to grips with who he was Jesus reassured that man that he would be in heaven today in paradise and packed in the word paradise is this wonderful place of life. It's not a grave of rotting flesh and bones. But I just want to mention to those of us who profess faith in Christ but did not look to the cross or are still not looking to the cross, guess what? You're still living a dead life. Still emotionally banged up from the effects of shame. Can you get that picture for me? Y'all gonna laugh. Walking around like Pepe Le Pew, leaving your stinky scent. Amen? Y'all remember Pepe Le Pew? I know your old, commercial, old cartoon from 1945. But still, you can take it down because they're gonna be laughing. Nobody gonna pay me any mind. Okay. <laughs> so I wanna ask you today are you sure today? that if you died, that you would be with Christ in paradise? I will, how about you? I don't have time to unpack all of that. But if you have any doubt, you need to get serious about who you are and about turning your head to the cross because there's no other power that conquered the grave. There's no other power that's mighty to save. Some of us really need to get beyond our present shame and focus on Focus on the coming glory and paradise. My third point, from one scarred hand to another, from one scarred hand to another, the nails in Jesus' hands represent the scars of sin on creation that he died for. And even though he was tempted in every way, he did not sin. You can find this in Hebrews 4.15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. His choice not to sin gives us hope for our future glory, that we can overcome any obstacle that tempts us to sin, including our shameful past. You can check out 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It should be in your supplemental scriptures. Jesus places our scarred hands in his scarred hand and invites us to be seated with him in the heavenly places. For those of us who have turned to Christ and the power of the cross, he will move or remove our sin as far as is the east from the west. And you can find that in Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12, because it says this, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. He invited us to peace with God the Father. No longer enemies destined for hell because of our sin. He invited us into a personal relationship with God and healing from our shame. Amen. He invites us to see beyond our shame and focus on this coming glory and his goodness that will follow us all the days of our lives until he physically takes us to paradise. Amen. But for right now, in Ephesians 2, 6, and 7, it tells us that even though paradise is a place that's not yet, paradise is also a place that's here. 
Because it says there, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What is that saying? You can live in paradise now. And what is paradise? It's living your highest life for God. But so many of us live at another place, a place that's lower than God meant for us to live. We're, set, we're comfortable settling for a life that is so much further down from where God wants us to be. He wants us to live higher, to live better, to live beyond shame, to live so that we can be productive for him, to live that we can do his will in a way that shows others, hey, I belong to somebody who's great. I belong to the creator, and you can too. Hmm. God invites you to live this higher life today. But you have to get beyond shame. We all have scars. I have scars. You have scars. But we have to put all our scars in Jesus' hand. The thief on the cross trusted in Jesus' finished work before it was even finished. Can you imagine? He trusted in Jesus' finished work because he said, remember me in your kingdom. How did he even know? I guess he figured a king has a kingdom. But he saw the nature of Christ on the cross. How do people even know who you are unless they see the king in you? unless they see who you are, unless they see your nature. But people can't get past your nature if you're living defeated. If they see you struggling and struggling and struggling and complaining and complaining and complaining all the time, never have joy, never happy, trusting that God, God's got a plan for me and it's good. And I'm gonna get there. I'm just gonna be obedient and be in his will and do what he says do, and I know I'm going to get there. God is blessing me right now. Right now. Right now. There's nothing that he cannot do in my life. You see, we have to get rid of all that other stuff that's around us. We have to drown out all the background noise and just know that God's power is over all that he's sovereign. I know we can't see the finish right now. But remember, God's best work is yet to come. He's yet to take that final stage, amen, and give us his best, best performance. And that'll be that final day when he comes back to get us. But in the meantime, it doesn't stop him from doing great things in our lives. In the meantime, we know our sins are forgiven, we know God's done a great thing. We know he's cleansing us. We know he's healing us. We already know. We just know. We just have to embrace it. And we have to know that one day on a hill far away stood that old rugged cross that was the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was shame, was, was slain. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross where my trophies at last I lay down. I'll cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it one day for paradise, <laughs> for a crown. Amen? Hmm. Jesus knows just how far the east is from the west. He knows that sin is done when we accept him as Lord and Savior. He knows that shame is done when we accept him. I don't have to see the man I've been or the woman I've been come rising up in me again. 
I know that in the arms of Christ that I will find his mercy and rest because he knows just how far the east is from the west. So from one scarred hand to another, one scarred hand to the other, from one scarred hand to the other, I will place my hand in his hand because I know that Jesus has already done the great work. He's already done it. He's already healed me. He's already blessed me. He's already done it. I want you to listen to this song. It's called East to West by Casting Crowns and the words are also there. Derek, if you can. Not working? That's okay, it was a great song though. Would you go ahead and play the old rugged cross? Does everybody know the song? I know Sister Travis knows the song. Amen. I know Sister Itasca knows the song too. Amen. <laughs> 